I know, I know she said without further ado, but I'd like to make a little ado and add my personal thanks to uh, Dick Solomon and Pace Prince for making this exhibition possible. It was entirely to your generosity that the show is here, so we thank you very much. Now, Jim, you've been a printmaker all your life, even though this exhibition only contains the prints from 1985 through 2000. Now, you're also a painter, a sculptor, and a draftsman. How do you regard printmaking in the broad terms of your art? I mean, is it greater, more important, less important? Where does it stand for you? I, uh, it's, they're all the same. I'm, um, I was born as an artist and printmaking is just one of the ways that I express myself. It's, if I could do nothing else, I probably would print because it gives me so much pleasure um, all the time. I try to print um, every day when I'm in New York because I have facilities available. Uh, I try to go every day and do something because it's a way for me to um, begin, so begin a print or it's a way to begin a drawing. Printing for me is a, all about drawing. And without drawing, I, I, I wouldn't print. It's, um, I have said before that art saved me, but really print, print making, printing has, I mean, making prints has. It's, it's, it's allowed me to amplify means of expression and to um, try different images in ways that I wouldn't have been able to in painting, partly because I'm impatient and I can get a result faster in printing. Um. When, when you print, uh, do you draw first? Do you make a drawing first and then go to a print? Mean, or do, do I make studies? Yes, or do you, you go straight to the print? I never make studies for anything. And when I mean, when I make, make drawings, even, the drawings are meant to be a finished work. So, no, I never make a study or anything. Some things come from other things, and printing allows me to, to save uh, plates and blocks of wood and then recycle them, particularly woodcuts. I've often cut them up and reuse them, or with etching plates, I erase with various power tools and then have that pentimento that I can um, rely on as a memory. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, one thing that's interesting about printmaking is that you can print by yourself, and you do, or a printer... No, 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 I don't print by myself. Uh -huh. do you I always never do. Uh, the, one of the reasons I print, and thanks for asking, is because to be an artist, for the most part, is lonesome. And I've been lucky to work with people who are, um, well, we're quite matey, you know. So it's, um, they've all, printers have always um, enhanced the act of me making what I make. Mm -hmm. I, I long ago gave up printing myself. I'm not, I, I, you, I presumed either I was going to be a printer or an artist. I mean, I couldn't do both. But you do, you are quite accomplished with various techniques. So you I'm can, you accomplished can make your own as prints. an artist, but not, okay. not as a craftsman. I, uh, it, would, it, takes, it would take too much of my time. And, and, and it's like, what's the point? If somebody has devoted their life to learning a craft, why should I do that? I've already, I've got, I've got to get this image out. What are, are there any negatives with working in collaboration with other artists, or is it all a very positive experience? You mean with other printers? With other printers. Yeah, uh, 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 negatives? Well, only if they're assholes. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. Otherwise, it's a pleasure, you know, <laughs> totally. Now, you've had the opportunity over your career to work with re some really extraordinary printmakers, Aldo Cromling for one. Uh, can you share any of the experiences, you know, some of the, tell us about some of the personalities you've worked with, with some of the experiences that you've had, whether professional or personal? I, um, early, I, I, when I first started to be an artist after school um, in New York, I, I, I wanted to print 
to make some prints. And I, I had a friend from college who ran something that was called the Pratt Graphic Art Center. It had to do with Pratt Institute of Art. And um, so I immediately started to print down there with a woman from Holland who was a wonderful printer. And it, it always was like that. I always found somebody who I could, um, we had rapport with. Um, I printed in the 60s with uh, Tanya Grossman at UALE and her printers. And for a long time, that was the benchmark for me of what quality was about and how you attained this thing in lithography. It was, that was about lithog stone lithography. And then I went and I printed in um, England. I went to live in England in 67 and lived there in London for four years, five years maybe, and printed it with a press called Petersburg Press, no longer in operation, but with wonderful young British etchers. And um, that was, I learned a little bit. But in 73 or two, Petersburg said to me, no, in 73, he said, a guy called Paul Cornwall Jones who ran it, he said, you know, Picasso has died and there's these two guys in Paris who always printed for him and they want some business. And the British artist Richard Hamilton had heard this, and who was a very, he's a very old man now, but he, was a, he is and was a precise engraver and etcher and he was trained that way. He said, these, this guy, Aldo Cromlink, is a fantastic printer. And so I said, I can go over and take a look. And then we met. And he was, um, it was very daunting. He had a beautiful studio. He had printed for this guy who was above being human, Picasso. And um, he was uh, very reticent. He had some English, but not a lot. And I had almost no French. And uh, the only thing we had similar was we smoked. And um, <laughs> We did a lot of drinking. And then, but I realized he had a wealth of, of information about what you could do on the copper plate. And I would always ask these questions, but he was extremely precise in his working methods, and I'm not. I mean, to the extent that we were like, like this, I mean, the opposite side of the coin. I'm dirty, he's clean. It was that kind of thing. But I, I learned so much about what, you, what was possible, what effects he could get, particularly good with Aquatint and particularly good with, I'm going to speak um, as though you all know what I'm talking about. With, but if you don't, well, afterwards we'll have questions. But anyway, he was very good with Aquatint and Sugar Lift. And um, we, he showed me that. And I tried to to get it into my brain, how I could make it mine. I'm always trying to make this thing mine. And uh, for about three years, we just walked around each other, and we, I, he lived above the shop in an elegant, small little villa in Paris, and he never invited me up. <laughs> and um, he always went up for lunch, and I went outside, you know. And um, then we gradually started to get friendlier, and then I would have lunch with the, he and his wife. And we always talked about printing, what you could do. But he was very rigid. He would only print on one kind of paper. He would only use one kind of ink. There was only one kind of ink to use. Only his steel face guy was the only one you could use. I appreciated his standards. He had a standard for everything. And then eventually I subverted him and uh, <laughs> fucked up his shop and you know there was there was um, I started to bring in sanding tools for power tools and uh, copper dust was everywhere and he would like he couldn't believe it but he he's so polite that he was unable to tell me to stop and it wasn't about greed or his pleasure with working with me he just had the best manners of anybody I ever met and um, I at the same time I would start to uh, about 76, I, I, I went with Pace Gallery and Dick, who's here, Solomon, and he had Pace Editions, and I would start, we had to print, you know, there were other things, I, I wasn't always in France. So um, I was living in Vermont, and I, 
Um, I had been at an artist in residence at Dartmouth College in the early 70s and met a young man who they gave me to print for me. And he didn't know anything, and I hardly knew. I, gave, I knew what Aldo had ta taught me. But this young guy and I, we sort of talked to each other about what you could do, particularly with power tools um, like die grinders and um, the Dremel tools. Uh, rotary discs, things like that. And he then moved down to live in the town where I live. And I, I had a shop for a couple of years. I had a press and he would print and sometimes my cousins would proof for me or my kids and um, it was very casual. But we, the, the quality of the print itself was not precise like Cromlings. It wasn't this thing that just stood up like that, but it had a quality that I was going for, which is what I was getting in my drawings too, was the sense of my hand. So I was, I, I, I was, um, I learned a lot. His name was Mitchell Friedman, and he and I really grew up in etching together. And um, I had left lithography behind. Um, it was becoming too precious with Mrs. Grossman and. Maybe by that time she was dead or, or was old and um, it was just, I couldn't deal with the people. That's an example of not, of, of not being such a friendly situation. The printers weren't so nice and um, uh, I wasn't, uh, anyway, I wasn't, anyway, it didn't work out so well. Okay. And um, um, when did we meet Wilfer? Yeah. Um, then Dick hired Joe Wilfer, and, who had been here, and then he was at Skowhegan School of Art for a summer or something. And then he came down and went to work, and Wilfer was amazing to work with. I'm still working with Cromlink, too, all this time. It's just that I'm not getting to go to France all the time. And Wilfer was the sort of guy who just, he, you just could say to him, could you do this, could you do that? And he'd say, no problem. Well, it was always a problem because he didn't half the time know what he could do, but he would never say no. I told you this morning, he's the youngest Eagle Scout in Wisconsin. <laughs> he was, and it was very obvious he would do anything like that, you know, to try to learn a new technique, learn something new. And that was very enlightening, really great. And, um, um, until he died, I, uh, I printed with him, but in the meantime, Dick brought Cromlink to America. Mm -hmm. And so for part of the year, Cromlink would be in with Pace Editions. And so he and Wilfer, was, it was a dynamite combination, even though they were not necessarily, they would walk around each other too. They were, it was great to have this resource. And Wilfer brought with him from Wisconsin, from Madison, uh, I think two women, uh, Kathy Keene and, and Ruth Lingham, who were his students, I think, here. And th they're still there. Plus, uh, the, a young woman came in and a guy called Bill Hall and Julie DiMario and Aldo Cromlink taught them how to edge. So that's where I am today. I mean, I don't ever, those people are all there except Joe and Aldo's retired to France, so he's not even printing there. But um, I've, I've gone off other times. There's a wonderful printer who I print with in Vienna, but it's far away. And there have been win winters when I've lived there and printed with him. He's called Kurt Zein, and he's an etcher and a woodcut artist. But he also is able to make very big Elio gravures. Um, and then I've, I've printed in, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, too, with the, in the 80s with a man called Niels Bork Jensen, who was also inventive. And I learned some things from him that uh, and there were, he's the only person I ever worked with. I stopped working with him, A, because he was too expensive, but also he wouldn't share his secrets. Hmm. You know, I couldn't take this, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, he had a great trick. And um, just recently, we've got it. You know. <laughs> okay. Wait a minute, we just, I, I kept describing it to the printers at Pace, and we, find, we got it, you know. So I said, too bad, Niels Bohr. You know. <laughs> now his secrets were uh, how to achieve an effect yes, or how to, effect. how to achieve something. And he okay. was very good on all kinds of things and he could do enormous aquatints. 
but he wouldn't tell me how he could. He said, if you use this uh, stuff, it will make beautiful aquatint like clouds. You could make clouds. And the more you use, the more you piled it on, the more, and I couldn't figure this out. It was like glue and how why it went down. And, and he never would tell me. And it was a really beautiful technique. And now I got it. <laughs> well, a question that would pop to mind immediately would be, if you're comfortable with having other people apply techniques that they use, that you don't want to master the technique, how does that affect you not knowing the secret of how to achieve in it? In his case, in that case, it affected me by not using it again until I found out how I could do it. Because okay. um, I didn't want to use him anymore. I thought it was damned unfriendly. <laughs> um, and in the end, short-sighted, I didn't go back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I make a lot of etching. Um, but uh, it's also, if you etch a lot and you have a feeling for the metal like I do, um, it becomes evident that there are things that go to another thing that are part of the process but are also the way you birth an image. Mm -hmm. And for instance, in this piece, which is, the, I guess, the biggest piece in the show, mm -hmm. um, I made it at the University of South Florida at a studio called Graphic Studio with a man who I've printed and has been my friend for many, many years, but he was a printer always, but then it became an entrepreneur called Donald Saff. And he had guys who had trained at Gemini and in LA, that is, and um, other uh, university print shops, and they had various techniques, but the main guy he brought, is this getting like an echo? We I think we hear the echo here. Uh, I don't think it carries over. Anyway, he, he brought with him to South Florida a man called Deli Sacciolato who did have a secret. And his, he also wouldn't tell it, but you almost don't want to know it because it was too much trouble. But it was, br <laughs> it was brilliant. And it's, it's, um, he could sandblast um, Elio Gravure through a woodcut. I mean, he could, well, almost like an aquatine. He, he can do it through sandblast and resist, and that was a brilliant technique, which I, I, I could, I drew some of these images, not the middle, the central image, these are lousy slides, uh, but, and the, the pieces upstairs, you can see it after this, but the center, central image, I, I cut by hand with a Dremel, uh, myself, of the dancer, who's wrapped, but the two side panels are from mylar, I painted on mylar, and they were put onto a block of wood, and then sandblasted away. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a spectacular technique. It just, it's a lot of trouble, mm -hmm. and you don't always need it. But the background in that, I also learned the technique from um, a guy in Milan. I went down to see a printer in Milan. He, was, he, was, he had been Palladino's printer. And I, I, I said to him, I, how, do you, how does Palladino get these big washes without like a without seeing the dot pattern from Aquatint, you know. He said, well, it's simple, you know, you don't put, uh, he, he prints on iron and uh, on steel, mm -hmm. and uh, not stainless, just steel, and uh, you don't need an Aquatint. I had no idea. So the whole background of that, the blue, which you see upstairs is quite vivid, blue, uh, these are big steel plates that I, and it was Florida, so you were outside, and we just had um, nitric acid in the bucket with a mop and just threw it around with a big yellow cloud, you know, <laughs> when you're outside. Um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure for me to print, you know, I'll tell you. It's lots of, lots of action. Now, you know, you talk about using uh, power tools, sanders, drills. Now you're talking about a, a mop and, you know, with bucket I don't masks. use this stuff glibly, by the mm -hmm. way. I use it to to be able to express myself in an easier way and in a fuller way than with just a burin or with just a needle or, and it's not just a, it's, I mean, when Rembrandt made a print or when Whistler made a print, a little, an etching, they were this big and my ambition for these things is much greater. And you know, I could take a year and I wouldn't get halfway through it if I didn't have a mop and a, mm -hmm. you know, and a chainsaw. <laughs> 
Now, you know, a lot of, a lot of these techniques have, they're sort of tradition bound. You know, I can't picture a Japanese uh, woodblock uh, printer, you know, using a, a chainsaw or, you know, even Rembrandt probably, you know, there were very strict rules. Uh, do you believe in tradition or you're breaking tradition? Yes, I do. I really, I believe in the tradition of printmaking and I mean of draftsmanship. I believe in great art and that, that, that I don't come from nowhere and that I am in, in uh, I mean, genetic, genetically, I knew who my parents were, just. But artistically, I'm very clear where I come from. And I'm, I'm proud of, to be in that tradition. And, but there are, as I said, there are certain things that have to be, I have to do to make it mine. Um, and there's a lot to be learned from history. I mean, right now at, at Pace Editions, they have a, a traditional ukiyo-e, woodcut artist who does things for Chuck Close and he's doing something for Helen Franklin for law, for and but so he, he's a sweet man but he and I cannot exist in the same room mm -hmm. because they've sent me downstairs because <laughs> I mean it's all very precise what he does and I've got you know there's a lot of sawdust when I'm working so um, is there any printing technique that you uh, don't like or prefer not to use yeah I don't like silkscreen very much can I ask why I, I just don't like it. It looks, okay. it's silly to me. I mean, I, 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 I don't like it. It sits up on the paper, all that ink. I mean, <laughs> it's a little gross. All right. Well, you know, one thing we have is we've got these two pairs of slides and we've got another five pairs. We wanted to limit the uh, work. Could I get you to, perhaps you've talked a little bit about this print. Could I get you to talk about these slides, each one about how you made it and, you know, why Maybe. it's important yeah, I mean, to you? If I, if I can remember. I, well, I talked about that sort of, but this one also is a very big print. And the one on, I believe this side is a um, linoleum block or a woodcut, I forget. And then we printed it the, uh, onto uh, a litho plate. So that one's a litho and this is a linoleum block or vice versa. They're black and white. And, um, that was, that was done on um, the background, I forget how, but the, the, line, the drawing is done with um, uh, polymer, with uh, acrylic medium, with pumice in it, and letting it dry, and then printing it. Like, as though it was, well, etching printers printed it, printed it but it, mm -hmm. I guess you could call it a collotype, maybe, but I wouldn't. I would call it, <laughs> well, you know, with pumice in it. <laughs> you know, one of the things that amazed me as I was going through the exhibition, it's something I encourage you know, everybody who goes up to see the show, is look at the work, but also look at the label, uh, the variety yeah. of techniques that you use and the creative ways that you use them together is really surprising. I don't think there's another artist uh, alive who's doing that kind of thing. Well, uh, it's, I mean, I, I, I'm not doing it because I'm, there's no other artist alive doing that kind of thing. I'm, I'm doing it because, out of necessity. I mean, this one is from, it has a long history, but a, original, it was from another print I made of these tulips, which came from a book from the end of the 18th century called, an herbal book called The Temple of Flora in England. And I had made variations on it, and then I think I had made a watercolor or something. Anyway, I had it photolithoed onto a plate, onto a piece of paper. And then I hand colored it, and then I put an etching over it. And it, I did it not because, and I didn't do any of these things to get, because to be different or for variety. It's because each time I felt the need to do that one thing, to make the thing be born in a full way. Mm -hmm. you know? Before that, I felt it was dead. Is it the process that intrigued you or the final final thing? Final effect. Thing. I don't, don't, I mean, process is fine, but if, if it, that's all you got, you know, as they said, it's all technique, no ideas. You know? Okay. Oops, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, that piece is called the Garrity Necklace, and it's, um, it's a, quite a big etching, and it's the it, first time I really used the Dremel tool. I, I drew on the, the copper plate 
with a magic marker, and then I insisted on myself to myself that I follow it as close as I could. And to use the Dremel on copper is, is sometimes difficult because it skips or you miss it, you know. And uh, but I was really proud of this when I did it. And also, it has it has just two plates. The color was first put on in separate areas. It's called a la poupée, and it was a very good printer. Very good printer. And this one is a wallpaper, wallpaper um, that I found in a roll. Actually, Ruth Lingham showed me a book of wallpaper. And it was from um, a very expensive British wallpaper dealer. So in its hand silk screen, there you go. <laughs> um, but it's from a, obviously a painting and for the kitchen or something. And I thought it was so crazy, this thing, this wallpaper. It's very beautiful paper it was on. And then I gessoed the shape of the owl and then oh, over the wallpaper to block it out so I could print over it. And then we printed it with a, with a lithograph technique that I never saw again and that we, everybody has forgotten about it, how they did it. They got it from a book, I think, and it's called, I think, Psy lithography, but I'm not sure. But they printed it on an etching pr press, but it was done on a polymer plate. I, and we could hardly get many out of the edition. How does that work? You know, I'm a little curious now. Let's say, do you come in and you say, look, I really want to get this effect. How do I do it? And No, I, 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 you mean how do I, what do I say to a Right, printer? I mean, you know, let's say you say you, you used a very unusual lith lithographic technique here. Okay. Why? And you've no, never they used brought it sense. to me. They brought it the to you. The printer said, "Look, we got. We know some guy who's doing this. You want to try it?" Okay. Okay. You know, but we never used it again. You know. Okay. And it, it it was especially appropriate for working on the wallpaper. No. No. Not at all. <laughs> okay. it, was, it was difficult, actually. Okay. No, it could have been much better done on, with the etching. <laughs> um, this is one I did with Wilfer. Uh, it's a woodcut and it's also hand painted. Uh, the backgrounds are hand colored and it's, maybe it's an etching too, I forget. I'd have to look upstairs. Mm -hmm. It was a long, long time ago in the 80s. But the love and grief were from a woodcut that I made. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one is an example. I was sitting in Vienna with um, this printer, Kurt Zein, and we were uh, talking that we always talk about printing. And we were, um, I said, listen, can't we can't you make an etching look like charcoal drawing? Um, it would be great, because I love to draw with charcoal. So it took, took him a year, and then he had this idea. And, this, and the idea is, you just use a piece of cardboard. I don't mean corrugated. I mean, that's layered together, glued. I mean, so it's, you know, maybe it's an eighth of an inch thick. And then I cut it with a Dremel, or I cut it with sometimes with a chainsaw. But on this one, it's all a Dremel. And this is the black plate I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, the color ones, I don't remember how I got it, uh, but I'd have to look at it. But the black plate was just a piece of cardboard. I cut it, incised it, the drawing, and then I painted it with gloss acrylic medium and let it dry. And then it's wiped as an etching. And it's, it's very warm and fuzzy line. And it, I've, I, there's quite a few in the show upstairs. Uh, there's a big black owl I did that with that you can get really beautiful blacks. With. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's just a straight etching. Okay. Um, on copper. And uh, this is um, an etching but it's printed with white ink. And it's, it's after it's from the Glyptotech in Munich. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a hunting dog that I'd made a drawing of, and um, a woman who sells my prints at Pace called Kristen Hemming suggested that I might want to translate some of the drawings into printing. And I'd done that in other things, but I'd never, not the big ones I did, and I did this at her suggestion, and it seemed to work okay for me. You know, I'm going to jump into a question that I have later on a little bit. Uh, I was always intrigued with your interest in ancient Greco-Roman sculpture. And uh, in fact, several years ago here in Madison, we had your exhibition right, of at, uh, drawings at the Madison Art Center. Yeah. Uh, 
Greco-Roman art. It's not something I would have normally thought of when I think of Jim Dine. Uh, yet you were very intrigued by it, and you spent a lot of time there, and you continue. I to still go. I still go and look at it. I don't. I haven't dr uh, drawn from it in a long time. But um, all my life, I was. I was um, enchanted by the ancient world, so-called ancient world, and particularly Roman society. I had. Um, I went to a high school that you had to study Latin. And I did it very poorly. But it, if you did it, you went for six years to this high school. It was a public high school in Ohio, based on the Boston Latin School. And I got a lousy education there. But that wasn't their fault. You know? <laughs> I wasn't up to the task at the time. Uh, but I, they did succeed in giving me this tremendous romance into Roman life, really. Um, and it's about all I can say about it, because otherwise it, I've expressed it in my, my work. You know, that I, uh, when I walked into the Glyptotech, I thought, oh, I guess I was, uh, my breath was taken away. I just, I, I, the idea that, you, and then the privilege of drawing there and being able to meditate on this stone and to somehow communicate with this artist who is nameless, because most are copies from the Greek anyway, but it was just, as a cosmic experience for me. And I, I just haven't thought about doing it recently, although I was just there last week, so I, I'm still involved in it, mm -hmm. this world. Yeah, I, I was very struck when you described uh, with great pleasure the fact that they allowed you into the Glyptotech right. after hours so that you were not interrupted by other people. So this yeah. had a great deal of meaning It was daunting you. to draw in front of other people. And, and they have stools all through the museum where you can Take the, and there's a lot of archaeologists and art students who come and draw. I did it once and it was like terrible. I mean, people are looking over your shoulder and it was too self-conscious making. But I happened to know a man who was a director and he, he didn't realize I was interested and then he let me do this at night. It was a wonderful uh, treat. You know, when one thinks, uh, I'm going to get into the question of subject matter, I think. When one thinks of Jim Dine, one thinks of hearts, one thinks of right. robes, as we just saw. Uh, there are certain set images. I mean, the, the vocabulary is expanding. We now have owls, we have crows, uh, you know, we even have uh, landscape to a certain degree. But yet there's a, a limited vocabulary. Broad question, how important is subject matter to you, or is it important? Well, content for me isn't just um, a brushstroke. It, it, uh, I need something to hang the content on. And all these years, I've, I've, things have grabbed me by the back of the neck, and, and I've made them mine, i.e., I mean my subjects. And it is true. It's a rather limited subject, not vocabulary. But I believe it's a huge uh, amplification of the subject. It's a, I have a glossary of terms, and then I can work on within that. And um, for instance, sometimes people will say, oh, you're the guy who makes the hearts. And they have no idea that I do this. But it's OK. It's, uh, if that's what they've gravitated to, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm, there isn't a year goes by where I don't use most every subject matter that I've mined. You know, it's all grist from my mill. And I wouldn't let it go. I've spent too much time. I've invested too much um, emotion in these, in these subjects, in these objects that I've chosen as mine, as that are reflections of me, some phase of my personality. And in the, in the case of the earlier ones that came to me, bathrobe or the hearts, um, they've now lost their, I mean, the, the, the bathrobe was originally uh, uh, meant to be a self-portrait. It's now something in my vocabulary that I can paint, put the paint on, hang the paint on, and gives me, allows me to, within that, make a landscape, as it were, and still keep it mine. It's charged with a lot of emotion for me. Interesting name t title change. I was just looking at a catalog of your prints from going back you know, to the early 70s, and you had bathrobes, and the title said self-portrait. 
I look at your bathrobes upstairs and it says Rosie bathrobe. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was quite a change. In one case, oh, yeah, the is. title was very. Well, I'm very. Personal. I'm more aware that the titles of my work are are another piece of the work. Um, there's the paint. There's the support. There's my ideas, and there's the title. The title is very important to me, and words are very important to me, and. Um, I see them as another medium, another piece. You know? Now, you had love and grief on one of the prints that you showed. I mean, words don't creep into your work very often, but they did. Yes, they do. I think they do. Okay. I, 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 um, well, I think they do. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Now, one of the things that you've been doing a lot more of recently are art books. Um, I know you started to fairly early on, but they seem to be getting more frequent now. With these artist books? You mean artist books, that? yes. Yeah. Uh, is this an offshoot of your printmaking, or is this... Well, it is about printing, separate? always. It is about printing. I, I made, um, I made, a, I made uh, a book in the 60s with Petersburg Press that had etchings and lithographs in it. It was the, uh, it was the script for a play that was going to be put on called the, the novel, the Oscar Wilde novel, Portrait of Dorian Gray. And that was the first artist book I made, I guess. And then um, in, the, in the early 80s, Andrew Hoyam from the Aryan Press in San Francisco asked me to make, um, to illustrate the um, apocalypse according to St. John the Divine, which has a huge history of artists doing it. You know, Durer and Max Beckman and uh, I think Chagall maybe. I don't know, but a lot of people have done it. And uh, that was great. I made that with woodcuts. Uh, I made about 20 woodcuts for that. And since then, I've made quite a few books. It's once again a printing deal, you know. But it also gives me a chance to work with other people's words or match an image or not match the image or force the viewer to accept. I mean, I did, um, in the late 80s, I did a, a a long poem, which had been a favorite of mine by the Amer now dead American poet Frank O'Hara, called Biotherm, which was a kind of contemporary New York version of the Apollinaire poem Zone. And the O'Hara poem is so free falling and, and imp improvised. And I, I'm, I did so many prints for this that, in the same spirit of it, it was a great chance. But you, I, I mean, you have to accept it that it, one goes with another. I, I, I insist from the viewer that you accept it, but it's not illustration. I don't like that idea of illustration. I'd rather walk next to the writer. Well, that's a very different kind of collaboration. When you're collaborating with a printer, the printer is also helping the, you achieve also what you with want. Also, a guy who's dead, too. It's, uh, a, you know, <laughs> it's different. <laughs> but your, your books you've got, you know, the authors. I mean, what kind of collaboration do you have with the author, or does that... I, as I say, you, know, you get to walk next to them. You know, um, you hold hands and you hope it works out. So, <laughs> all right. Um, when you look at your work or other artists' works, what do you look for? You know, and I guess what I'm looking for is, let's say you're making a lot of prints, and then you get one and you say, okay, this is a really good piece. I'm really satisfied with this. What is it that you see that triggers that response to your own work or even to a? I don't say picture? that, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't say. I don't. Um, um, I, I'm not satisfied. I'm never satisfied. Never satisfied. Never satisfied. I mean, maybe for an instant, but the next day it doesn't look so great. <laughs> <laughs> but do you not have some prints that you're happier with, or some works that you're happier with? Sure, there are some things that speak to me down the road, lot better than others. But who knows? why that is. You know, I mean, I, it's, maybe it's about mood swings, maybe it's about the, the state of the world or my internal world, I don't know. Um, sometimes I know, but I'm not going to tell you. you know? <laughs> um, I'm, I hope for, I have, a, I have a control on myself in the sense that I have a sense of what it means to make a work that I'm proud of. And I don't let things out of my studio that I'm not proud of, but then sometimes I'm not proud of them after I, they've been out of the studio. 
what are you going to do? It's like raising children. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim, before, you know, we have a reception coming up in a short while, and we've got another uh, few minutes here. And what we'd really like to do is open it to the audience for questions. I think it's an opportunity for people to speak directly to Jim Dine and maybe get answers to some of the questions that I couldn't quite get. <laughs> yes. Um, as I said, the subject matter usually grabs me. I, do, I don't look for it. Um, it usually, I try to keep myself open to what's possible that I can make that expresses what I want to do. But um, and I have to think about, I don't know how open I want to be with you. <laughs> um, I um, listen. I'm in this for the long haul, you know, and so there is a, a, a sensor on me sometimes. I just don't go in and uh, like that, you know. I just don't do that. I, I have. I'm uh, I'm 68 years old, and I'm um, reasonably well analyzed. And so, therefore, I'm aware of a lot of things in my life and what I can do, what I can't do. And I also know that as dissatisfied as I may be with what I do or with what I see around me in that, say, art world now, in 100 years, everything could be completely changed. It's possible I'll be forgotten really possible because the first place there's more artists now than almost anything except people in marketing <laughs> um, but it's you never know why things you know I thought all my life I would be able to be conversant with what was going on in my world art world you know but I'm not I, I'm not I, I'm, I don't understand what I see most of the time now and it's not that's not a judgment not a value judgment, I accept that as a generational thing. Um, so I don't waste a lot of time looking at other people's work anymore, because it is a waste of my time. Other, unless it, you know, I like it and it pleases me or it strikes a, a note with me, just like a viewer would have, but I'm, I'm getting off the subject. Am I afraid? I'm always afraid in this world, but I'm not, because I wouldn't have gotten this far, obviously. So I trust my instincts and I go on my nerve. All right, we have a hand up there. Yes, uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship uh, between printing your art and, and the place in which you are. The, I was in Vermont and I spent some time in Kentucky and some of the first prints I saw were the Kentucky art prints. And I've always wondered uh, if there's a relationship between where you're working or living. Oh, uh, the place, you mean? The place. Yeah. It well, it would only be if, um, in, if, if they're called that, that was only a way to title something. I mean, it wasn't saying that I couldn't have done those anywhere else. Not at all. I, I, I'm, a, I'm like an itinerant artist. I travel all the time and I carry it on my back, what I do. Um, I'm really lucky considering how hyperactive I am and can't sit still or can't stay in one place. I'm lucky I can work everywhere. It doesn't matter to me, and I don't need a fancy studio. It's so, if that answers the question. I mean, I made a series of self-portraits when I was at Dartmouth called the Dartmouth Self-Portraits. What else was I going to call them? You know? <laughs> subject matter is not necessarily, or technique, well, I mean, technique maybe, but subject matter is not included in your art. It's where you are. Um, no, not, mm, no, no. <laughs> there was a hand up there? Yes. Nope. <laughs> no, I mean, what could I do? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you mean like a certain percentage of the population, or? Um, 
Never thought of it. I never thought of it. I, I, I just, as I said, I, I try to be proud of what I let out. And sometimes it, it's not what, up to what I w thought it was or what I wanted it to be. But um, I, I do what I do because I have to. Because that's all I can do. I was born with this thing in my hands. And I cannot do anything else. I really can't. I mean, I can, dri I can drive a car, you know, <laughs> but I can do very little else. And I don't want to. That's, I'm lucky at that. But if, there, if I was living, you know, it's like sometimes, I was thinking about this the other day, it's like 20 years ago, every once in a while, there would be a story coming out of Okinawa, say, that a Japanese soldier from the Second World War was found. He didn't know the war was over. He had hidden in a cave, that sort of thing. If I, hit, I, I could do what I do by hiding in a cave. I could. I mean, I'd still probably do the same thing. It probably wouldn't have as big a world view because I wouldn't be out in the world, but my world would be the cave. And I think I could do it that way. That's how, that's, I do what I do because I have to. All right, yes? Yes. That isn't from my childhood. That's genetically. I mean, I was born with the gift in my hands. But were there some people in your life when you were little or experiences? That All right. Uh, were there things in your childhood that influenced you to become the artist? Become the artist. And go ahead. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You mean, were there people who encouraged me. Yeah. Uh, yes, my mother did, up to a point. Uh, but I've, been, I've known I was an artist since I was, had language, or maybe before. I have a memory of that. And so I always drew. That's what I could do. So I'm two years old, I'm drawing. You know, I'm not, I'm not a child genius. I'm, I'm somebody who that's what I can do. So it's not like Picasso saying he could draw like Raphael when he was 10 or something. It's not, I couldn't do that. And in fact, I'm left-handed and dyslexic, and for many years I couldn't make my hands do what I wanted them to do. It made me crazy. But it worked itself out. Questions? Yes. Um, can you comment on whether computers have influenced you? No, not at all. Okay. No. It's not, I have nothing to do with them. All right, I, 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 I would, I, no. <laughs> um, how did Pinocchio come about? And I know this is a series of things. Good question. How did Pinocchio come about? And, and of the series, one was formed by you, or divided, divided two by you, and the other is the alphabet. Do you have copies of every one? Oh, the question is, um, how did Pinocchio, why, I guess, why did the subject matter? But also, do I keep copies of everything I do? Is that essentially it? Um, I try to. Um, I, I think I do, yeah. I mean, in every edition, there's artist proofs. So I, I, I keep them and put them away. And, you know, yeah, I do. But that, let's, that's not so important. It's Pinocchio. Um, uh, when I was, uh, if you're a little boy, it's a big story. And um, <laughs> when I was young, little, the movie came out in 1941. It really, really frightened me. And <laughs> when I was about 30, I saw the, a, a doll in a junk store put out by Walt Disney when the movie came out. So it was beautifully done. It was out, probably out of paper mache, but with real clothes. And it had faded a lot, but delicate. And uh, it was not um, a gross object. It was a, a delicate object. And I kept it all these years until I had to do something with it. So the Pinocchio story, the idea that this woodcarver 
brought to life this talking stick is that's the best part of the story for me. And it's, um, it's this idea like of God and man. Um, the, the downside of the story, of course, is frightening. It's about lying and lost boys. And uh, that's difficult still for me. Okay, because I'm a lost boy and I'm a liar. No. <laughs> yes. Well, um, um, uh, um, no, it's part, of, it's part of a bigger story of, of how you know yourself. I don't think, I know a lot of unconscious artists, you know, that, have, that don't really know who they are, and, and many times they are wonderful artists. And as far as what it has done for me, that's not... Your business. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman here. Oh, have I thought about that? Uh -huh. I actually, um, I, uh, tool, tools are something that never leave me, and um, my 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 love of them and the way they look and. Uh, these anonymous objects that were created by some work, working person's hands. Um, and so the, the gates I made in tribute to my friend Aldo and also because I thought screwy idea I had that it was going to be a way I could make an abstraction. I can't do that. But anyway, I, 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 didn't, I haven't done them in years and I, I'm not interested anymore, but I am making sculpture out of tools, yes. I, I, actually, some of the tools that you saw there, I still have molds for and have been using them this summer again in, in other ways. Other questions? Yes. In, in, in relationship to what? Um, I don't know. Uh, honestly, I, not absurdly, I don't know. Um, it seems right. It, sometimes it's not right. I, I, I've, I've, in recent years, I've become a photographer, and it's, um, it's more of an issue with me there. I, I question the scale a lot of different things that I didn't, I don't do that with um, drawing or painting or, or this, or sculpture. But sculpture I do, too. There's some, I don't know. Oh yeah, the subject comes first. But I mean, when I saw this, I, I, I thought the one upstairs looked puny in a way. I mean, it was too small for the scale. Curiously enough, on this one, I thought this was really grand. Okay, other questions? Yes? Well, if, if you collaborate, you know, you, you collaborate. And there are colors given to you and proofs pulled and you see something, you say, it was not quite right, I wanted it a little different. Or I accept it sometimes and then try to build on that. I like, um, I like that way of working, of building upon a mistake or just accepting what I get from one state and see if I can take that state and transform it, because this whole thing is about transformation, uh, into something that, as they say, works, or I can let out the door. Okay. You had a hand up? Could you share with us the meaning of uh, some of your symbols, like the heart and skull? And in other words, uh, what's with the heart? <laughs> <laughs> Changes year to year. Yeah. It changes year to year. Well, 
you know, when um, it does. It, uh, I, I, when I first started, I, I saw a guy once who did a little exhibition of symbol. One minute he did a red cross, he did a, a red heart. They were all about this big. This, I was young. Um, I was like 20 years old, 18. Saw it in New York at some little gallery, and I, and I didn't think about it anymore. But I, 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 I was asked to do the sets and costumes for Midsummer Night's Dream in uh, 1966, I think, the Actors Workshop in San Francisco. And I used the heart then as a motif in this dream world. And I remembered how much I loved Valentine's when I was a child. Valentine's Day. I thought it was really beautiful. I loved the doilies that you put around, you know, all that pasting and stuff. And I didn't have to do anything with my dyslexia. You know, I could do it. And um, so I thought maybe I could use this. And I started to do it. And I realized it's a kind of like the tools. It's a, it's an <clears throat> a symbol that it's more than this thing here, much more. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna, this is mine. I'm going to mine this. As I said, some years it's about being in love. Other years it's about needing something to hang your landscape on. All different. Sometimes it's anatomical, sometimes it isn't. Uh, my dear friend has given me uh, some things from Brazil called ex votos. You know what I mean? To ward off heart disease. So you see those, and some have ventricles carved into them, and some look like tops. And so somebody else is doing something with them too, besides me. I mean, it's not just this Valentine. It's I think much more. I hope. Uh, is that what you want? Okay. We have time for two more questions. Uh, yes. What do you what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> you think I, you uh, you want me to say that? Uh, yeah, of course it's, uh, it's different. Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, I've had, I've had since the car crash. I had 40, oh, 40 years since then. Can you imagine the things I've heard? I mean, really, that change a person. And not only that, I've um, I've made a lot since then, and. I've, um, I have bigger ambition for my art than I did then. I didn't know that I could want so much from it. Then. I was quite content then to be this young guy who just went like that, you know. And there's much more to it than that. And I didn't realize how much more poetry there was in it and romance. One final question, Joe. I'm, I'm uh, well. I'm less phobic than I was. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that. 
I really don't. I, you're absolutely right. I've been very lucky, and that's that's fine with me. I mean, you know. <laughs> Of course. That's what I'm in. I told you, I'm in this for the long haul. Immortality. Don't you get it? Really? Jesus. All right. Well, Jim, thank you very, very much. Please join.